This story struck me both as very strange and curiously odd. As I present the details in this video, please allow yourself to have an open mind when it comes to the theories that may come about when you hear the story. With several twists and turns, I encourage you to please share your thoughts about this tragic and yet disturbingly unsolved family murder story. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mysteries Stories. All right, let's get into the intriguing case of the Maps family murder. Meet Edward Howard Maps, a man with a life that seemed to defy convention. Before trying to untie this knot, just know that Maps marched to the beat of his own drum. A sculptor by trade, he avoided the typical 9 to 5 grind, preferring a more bohemian lifestyle. He was a digital nomad of sorts, crashing with a revolving door of friends, most of whom were older women. His wardrobe? Well, let's just say he wasn't afraid to rock sandals in the dead of winter and channel his inner beatnik. Now, here's where things get interesting. A report penned just a day after the tragic events described Maps as a bit of a freeloader, lazy, insolent, and not exactly winning any popularity contest. The writer even speculated about Maps' sexual orientation, believing he was even a homosexual, painting a picture that clashed with societal norms. But hold your judgment, because, according to those who knew him best, Maps was a different breed altogether. Described as gentle, kind, and downright intelligent, he had a soft spot for our furry friends and was often seen rolling around the neighborhood with the local children on roller skate. When he wasn't busy sculpting or mingling with the locals, Maps had a penchant for collecting arrowheads, fossils, and other relics from the Bushkill area. And let's not forget his sense of humor, sly as a fox, they say. Like the time he showcased a painting at an art show in Stroudsburg, featuring a conspicuous red blob smack dab in the middle of the canvas. When curious onlookers inquired about its meaning, Maps cheekily quipped that it represented all that Stroudsburg knew about art. Now, when it came to alcohol, Maps enjoyed a cold one every now and then, but never let it go to his head. And his family? Well, he doted on his baby girl, Julia Louise, and never seemed to exchange harsh words with his wife, Christine. In fact, folks said he avoided conflict like the plague. But here's where the plot thickens. Just a month before tragedy struck, Maps went above and beyond to lend a helping hand to a neighbor on Sarah Street in need, caring for her critically ill husband so she could go to work day in and day out. Maps visited the dying man every day until his death. And then a chilling statement from a local grocer suggesting foul play may have been going on. Could Maps have fallen victim to hired hands with sinister motives? Or perhaps met a more sinister fate at the hands of someone closer to home? As the investigation unfolded, theories swirled, with many pointing to the possibility of foul play. Was Maps kidnapped and murdered, as some claimed? Or did he meet a more tragic end, submerged in the depths of an unknown river or lake, weighed down by a concrete block? Or is it possible that he was behind the deaths of his wife and daughter? Let's learn more about this story. The tale of the Maps family murder unfolds with the strained relationship between Edward Maps and his father-in-law, Robert Woolbach, as its backdrop. Money emerged as the root cause of their discord, with Maps defying Robert's objections to marry Christine. Their tumultuous relationship reached a boiling point when the trio lived under the same roof, with Robert convalescing from an injury. During this time, Robert claimed that Maps rarely left the house, preferring the solace of books over chores or employment. The strain intensified when the couple secured their own home, with Robert's estranged wife, Julia Woolbach, pressuring him to contribute to their down payment. However, Robert's toxicity extended beyond his son-in-law to his estranged wife, Julia. She filed for divorce, citing fears of Robert's physical violence and erratic behavior. Julia recounted one unsettling incident where Robert stormed into her home, hurling accusations of infidelity. The night of the murders casts a sinister shadow over Robert's alibi. He claimed to be on a plane from Miami to New York, a claim impossible to verify due to the lack of airline records. Furthermore, discrepancies emerged regarding his whereabouts, raising suspicions about his involvement. When a family friend, 
attempted to notify Christine Mapp's parents of the tragedy, he initially reached Julia Woolbach, who claimed Robert was on a flight from Miami to New York. However, the airline he purportedly flew with had no flights out that night. Additionally, the same family friend who notified Julia and identified the bodies was unable to get a hold of Mr. Woolbach until after 8 the following morning. When interviewed, Robert claimed to have checked into his hotel room at 3.15 a.m., yet records showed he hadn't checked in by 4 a.m. casting doubt on his timeline. Amidst the aftermath of the tragedy, further disturbing revelations surfaced, shedding light on the sinister nature of the events that transpired. Julia Woolbach's discovery upon entering the MAPS residence to retrieve belongings painted a chilling picture. All of Mr. MAPS' sculptures lay shattered, a deliberate act of destruction that hinted at a deeper motive than mere vandalism. The fire, which ravaged the home, seemed an unlikely cause for the destruction of the sculptures, as other items had largely remained untouched. This deliberate targeting of Mapp's artwork suggested a personal vendetta, perhaps reflecting the assailant's desire to inflict the same devastation upon Mapps himself. As scrutiny intensified, glaring discrepancies emerged in the portrayal of Mapps' character. While Robert Woolbach painted a damning picture of Mapps, alleging laziness and even insinuating homosexuality in a scathing report written shortly after the fire, others offered a starkly different perspective. Robert was once quoted as saying he lived under my roof, ate my food. He was a good-for-nothing mooch. First, my daughter fell for his sensitive artist crap, then my stupid tramp wife did too. Then they all left me for that lazy bum who doesn't even like women. Friends, family, and acquaintances portrayed Maps as gentle, kind, and intelligent, with a penchant for humor and a love for his family. The glaring disparity between these contrasting accounts raised questions about bias and motive, casting doubt on the credibility of the report and the motivations behind its creation. Amidst the fog of suspicion, an unidentified witness offered a chilling theory, suggesting that while Woolbach may not have directly committed the murders, he may have orchestrated them. The witness proposed the possibility that Woolbach had hired someone to carry out the heinous act, leaving Mapp's fate uncertain, speculated to be submerged in the depths of a lake or river, a concrete block serving as his grim anchor. As investigators delved deeper into the tangled web of evidence and testimonies, the truth remained elusive, obscured by layers of deceit and manipulation. On a fateful June 21, 1962, the night sky was pierced by the piercing wail of sirens as firefighters rushed to extinguish a blaze at 510 Sarah Street in Stroudsburg. Inside the inferno, they discovered the unconscious bodies of Christine Mapps, a 22-year-old, and her precious four-month-old daughter, Julie Louise. Both were swiftly transported to Monroe County General Hospital, but tragically, little Julie Louise succumbed to her injuries upon arrival. Her mother, Christine, battled for life but succumbed the next day due to severe head injuries. Her skull had been fractured by a blunt instrument at least four inches wide. As the smoke cleared and investigators combed through the charred remains of the home, the chilling details of the crime began to emerge. Immediately, within hours of the blaze, a warrant was issued charging Maps with arson and homicide, catapulting him onto the FBI's infamous 10 Most Wanted list, where he would remain a fugitive for almost five long years. Over the years, sightings of Maps trickled in from various corners of the globe, from Maryland to Turkey to Mexico. Yet, it was an audacious bank heist in Little Falls, New Jersey on August 7, 1962, that provided the most credible lead. A lone gunman, later identified as Maps from FBI photos, held up the Little Falls, New Jersey Savings Bank, mere miles from his birthplace in Passaic, New Jersey. Despite the relentless pursuit, Maps remained elusive, evading capture for years until his removal from the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list in 1967, at the behest of the Monroe County District Attorney. His fate remained a mystery until October 21, 1971, when he was officially declared dead. And with the destruction of his fugitive file by the FBI in December 1977, the enigma of Edward Howard Mapps seemed destined to endure, leaving behind a legacy of unanswered questions. As I dove into the different facts of this murder, there are many curious, disturbing, yet at the same time quite interesting details. 
let me try to describe a timeline up to and just after the murder and subsequent fire. On the night of the crime, Maps and Christine took the baby to visit a neighbor at around 8.30 p.m. They brought an apple pie for her. The neighbor also knew Robert Woolbach, and she mentioned that she had received a letter from him recently. She reported that Maps said, I hope he does not come up and make us trouble. The couple left at 9.05 p.m. to put the baby to sleep. The fire was reported at 10.48 p.m., and the fire inspector estimated that it had been burning for about 40 minutes. What happened in that hour after the Maps family returned home? The physical evidence found at the crime scene was this. Christine Maps was struck in the head at least three times with great force, with a four-inch square blunt instrument. The murder weapon was never found. Her right hand was badly bruised. Police concluded that these were defensive wounds, obtained as she was protecting herself. They could also have been offensive wounds obtained by striking an assailant with her right hand. Maps was accused of bludgeoning his 22-year-old wife, Christine Woolbach Maps, on the night of January 21, 1962, and setting fire to their home at 510 Sarah Street to cover up his crime. He was further accused of leaving his four-month-old daughter, Julia Louise, in the house to die of smoke inhalation. There were ten fires lit in the house, made from piles of paper and clothes. No accelerants, such as gasoline or flammable liquid, were used by the arsonist, raising questions about whether there was premeditation. The gas stove in the pantry was turned on to 450 degrees. The doors to the house had been locked from outside with a key. There was also this additional evidence that was never explained. The body of Christine Maps was found in the kitchen. Near her was a bloody plate stained with animal blood. There was also a kitchen chair, a block of slate, and a woman's ice skate covered with animal fur. The Mapses had recently moved into the house. They had a new baby and reportedly did not have a pet. No theory for the presence of animal hair and blood on the objects near Christine Mapp's body was ever developed. Amidst the wreckage, two cars belonging to Edward Mapp sat parked nearby, keys still in the ignition, a haunting reminder of the absent figure in this tragedy. His wallet and identification were discovered amidst the ruins, but Maps himself was nowhere to be found. Maps was charged with murder and arson within three hours after the 10.48 p.m. fire alarm. Monroe County District Attorney James Marsh lived a few blocks from the fire scene. It was an unseasonably temperate evening for January. Marsh walked downhill from his home and began to aid the firefighters in their duties, searching the house for clues. He discovered several pieces of evidence, including a leather wallet in the living room with identification belonging to Edward Maps. He engaged a photographer, Roderick MacLeod, to shoot photos of the crime scene and autopsy. A photo of Christine Maps, lying unconscious and bloody on the floor of her burned home, appeared on the front page of the local newspaper, the Daily Record, the next morning. As soon as Marsh heard that the baby was dead upon arrival at the hospital, he began to personally search for maps all over Monroe County. He made a state trooper escort him to five different diners, the bus and train stations, several residences in Bushkill, and one in Polk Township. He woke up a justice of the peace, Floyd Kellogg, at 2 a.m. to swear out a warrant charging maps with homicide and murder. He ordered the state police fire investigator from Hazleton to meet him at 6 a.m. in Stroudsburg at the crime scene. A state trooper wrote dryly in his report of February 3, 1962, D.A. James Marsh advised this writer that he was taking an active part in the current investigation. There is no indication that Marsh ever considered a suspect other than Maps. It was reported that Woolbach did not believe Maps was penniless and told his wife he would prove to her that Maps had money. It was discovered after Maps disappeared that he had a $30,000 trust fund from which he received a monthly income. Woolbach stated that in October, when the baby was just a month old, Maps scolded him about closing a door and Woolbach slapped him in the face. The report states, Robert Woolbach said that he served notice on the accused that he should be out of the premises by November 3rd and that if he did not get out of his way, he would kill him. Woolbach said he blamed Maps for destroying his marriage to Julia. Oddly, none of these events made Robert Woolbach a suspect in the disappearance of Edward Maps. By November 3rd, all the furniture was moved out of the house at 521 Thomas Street. Woolbach moved back to New York City, 
where he had worked as an art supervisor for the city school system. Julia Woolbach, Edward Maps, Christine, and their baby stayed at a friend's home for four days. Julia Woolbach moved into a small apartment at 540 Main Street. Maps, Christine, and the baby stayed with her until they moved into the house on Sarah Street. Christine Maps is reported to have contributed $1,000 toward the down payment. The Daily Record newspaper reported an interesting detail. The unoccupied Woolbach house and the Maps home were located almost back to back. It was possible to walk out the back door of the Maps residence, across the alley, and directly onto the property of Robert Woolbach. Two days after the fire, a credible witness, a retired executive who was introduced to Maps by Robert Woolbach, received a telephone call while he was having breakfast at 8 a.m. The man's wife answered the phone. The caller politely asked for the husband by his first name, saying please, but did not identify himself. The executive recognized Maps' voice. Maps allegedly said, I'm sorry for calling you so early. When you see Bob, I want you to tell him that I forgive him. The executive did not ask what he meant by this. He told Maps to turn himself in to the police. Maps said, I can't do that. The executive continued saying, sooner or later you will have to turn yourself in. Maps replied, perhaps, ironically, I have too many things to do. Maps changed the subject to something ordinary, saying, I saw your painting at Wyckoff's department store. I liked the frame, but it was hung too high. He mumbled something that sounded like, I want you to give my love to Julia, and then he hung up abruptly. No one ever heard from or saw Edward Maps again. Michael Chaplin, a retired state police officer who reopened the Maps case in 1993, believes this call is proof of his guilt because an innocent man would have told the executive that he had been kidnapped. But Maps was not an ordinary man. The word used most often to describe him was eccentric. Furthermore, he had a history of emotional trauma. Maps was a U.S. Marine during World War II who saw nine months of active duty, including a month at Iwo Jima. He was discharged from the service in November 1945 and treated at a naval hospital for severe emotional illness. At the time, his mental status was described as, quote, retarded, and his VA medical record says that he suffered from hallucinations, which today might be called flashback. The diagnosis Maps received was called schizophrenia. According to VA press officer Vince Ricardo, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was not used as a diagnosis until 1980. Within hours of the crime, Edward Maps was named the prime suspect in the murders. Maps was never seen again, though he was at the top of the FBI's most wanted list, until 1967. The investigation into the Maps homicide was propelled mostly by circumstantial evidence. The most damning evidence against Maps was his disappearance. A news article in the Herald Tribune of Passaic Clifton, New Jersey, Maps' hometown, pointed out that Maps had no motive for the crime and nothing to gain by doing it. The Monroe County District Attorney James Marsh told the newspaper he believed Maps found marriage and the burden of paying a mortgage intolerable after years of carefree existence. He conceded to the reporter that it would have been much easier for Maps to simply walk out and begin a new life somewhere else. Several sightings of Edward Maps were reported over the years, from Maryland to Turkey to Mexico, but the most credible sighting came on August 7, 1962, when a lone gunman held up the Little Falls, New Jersey Savings Bank. He was later identified from FBI photos as Edward Maps. Little Falls is located only five miles from Passaic, New Jersey, where Maps was born. In 1967, Edward Maps was removed from the FBI's 10 most wanted list at the request of the then Monroe County District Attorney. Maps was declared dead on October 21, 1971. The FBI reportedly destroyed Maps' fugitive file in December 1977. Edward Maps has never been located, and the murders of Christine and baby Julie Louise remain unsolved. If Edward Maps was still alive today, he would be over 100 years old. What are your thoughts on this story? Let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. 
I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.